thank you all for coming. Uh, NICAR is working with NASBAR to help NASBAR members learn about commercial real estate. We all look forward to making this a productive educational experience. My name is Peter Katsarillos. I'm the uh, president-elect of NICAR, as well as a bro broker with KW Commercial, and I am a partner with Self Storage Developers. I will be, will be moderating this event. We at NICAR and NASBAR are pleased to have a panel of commercial real estate professionals that have many years of experience in the commercial real estate arena. These expert com experts come from a variety of fields, including marketing, education, brokerage, developing, uh, senior, senior living, title and trust, and much more. The members of the panel are Rebecca Carlson from Carlson Integrated, uh, uh, Teresa Mueller from Corellium Real Estate, Matt Ellicott from uh, the Ellicott Group, Christopher Kaufman from Am Trust Title, Marty Norcott from Norcott and Associates, and Bill Caton from Caton Commercial Real Estate Group. I will be asking a series of questions to the panelists that, that pertain to commercial real estate industry and how current residential brokers can get involved. You, will, you are welcome to ask questions during the discussion, but please keep the questions brief and to the point in regards to the, the uh, subject being discussed. <clears throat> One very important announcement is that there will be an hour networking afterwards uh, for networking with wine and cheese and this will be sponsored by Caton Commercial Real the Caton Commercial Real Estate Group. Thank you, Bill. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I will make this. It won't be a, a form of. If somebody wants to say something in the panel, they can raise their hand and um, you know, make it make a, a statement. But I will do. What I will do is ask advice questions. And the number one I'm asking is uh, here's a scenario. A residential broker's client asks, I want to buy or sell or lease commercial property. The broker asks himself, what do I do now? Where do I start? What do I need to know? How do I, where, who do I turn to? Uh, with this question, I'd like to start with Mr. Bill Caden to uh, give, give him some comments on this. So my first answer would be don't. <laughs> okay. Freak out. All right. Um, I in fact, uh, Marty reminded me, I knew, knew the content, but I forgot Article 11. Uh, it says something like, if you're not competent, aka in the area, and you're not doing your client justice, you are in violation of your ethics. So if you are sitting here and you're asking this type of question, that tells me already that you're not competent, all right? Uh, and so you need to move on to somebody that is competent and work with them and I think that you're going to see some other things come up here about mentoring and I'll have some words to say about mentoring. Please excuse me, I, I made a mistake. I want each of the members to, to introduce themselves and say a little bit about what they do in the commercial industry. Marty. Yeah. Okay, I'm Marty Norgut and I was trying to think, I actually started in Oregon Associates in 1971 but been in this business now since 67 so that's 55 years. In the last seven years, what I've done is taken this information and experience and converted it into educational courses, which I was very happy Deb, the bore way in the back, was my mentor in education. It's rewarding to give back. And with Rebecca's help, I'm going to be doing more classes, uh, certified education classes. And I have two of my mentors here, Matt and Scott. So it's been very rewarding. So that, that's how easy I am. <laughs> so Marty recently transferred his license to me so that we can focus on building that education and mentorship practice. I'm a managing broker. I have actually been a managing broker for the past five years prior to that. I have had my license actually since 2003. And I started off my business experience in commercial real estate out of school, fresh with a political science degree, no business experience whatsoever. And the reason I got my license was to learn the vernacular of what was spoken in the office. I had no idea what anybody was talking about at all. So in 2003, I got my license and I was in the commercial real estate investment space. I have kept my managing broker license up and I have a marketing company now, which is the, my primary focus on the professional side. I have a team of 12 women who work with me, so we're an all-woman company doing amazing things all over the country. 
and then on the real estate side, I get to work with Marty. So it's, it's nice seeing you all. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Matt Ellicott, so I'm a CPA, my background's accounting and finance, and then in 2016 I resigned and I got into real estate full time. So my bread and butter is residential, and two years ago my office started a commercial division with a mentorship program, which is how I got introduced to Marty, and I took him up on that invitation for mentorship, so I've been gradually building up the commercial side of my business. Uh, I'm Teresa Mueller, uh, managing broker of Trellium Real Estate. A uh, very brief history because then you'll understand how I started in commercial, which is uh, also not a typical um, path. I had master's in engineering, I went into business consulting with Anderson Consulting, and then when I started real estate, I was with a very large brokerage, and even though I started residential, uh, I would have investment properties, so people would contact me about that. And then when people left what's now called Accenture, they're all type A entrepreneurial personalities like me, and they would say, hey, I need retail or office space. Uh, now it's all warehouse space. But that's sort of how I landed do more commercial deals. And um, you know, we can get into the mentoring and education component. But uh, I have been my own managing broker for over 18 years now out of uh, downtown Naperville. I'll really kind of introduce myself. I'm uh, Bill Caton. I'm the founder and CEO of Caton Commercial. Uh, I got on this business uh, along the same time as I was doing another career, one of those co-career people that, you know, people say you can't do that, so I set out to prove them wrong, uh, and I think I did, because uh, during the time that I was uh, science department chairman and teaching at, at Bolingbrook High School for 34 years, uh, I started a commercial real estate business because I'm hyperactive and need to keep myself busy. Uh, during that time, uh, I amassed uh, eight offices, uh, six of them were residential, so I understand the residential area of having uh, about 270 residential brokers at my peak and about 30 commercial brokers in two separate offices. Fast forward, my two children who I pushed out to college and said go do something else, uh, found out the world was a little bit harder than they understood our business, so they came back to me. They're 2010, they're my partners in business now, and they afford me the ability to come to do things like this and go to Mippen in France or go to Expo Real in Germany and stop by the Oktoberfest while you're there. You know, so they're setting me up for the next 20 years of my life to, to be their ambassador, and I'm fine with that. So that's a little bit of my background. Most importantly, Bill's also sponsoring the After Hours events. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's good to see some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, I'm Chris Kaufman. I'm with Amtrust Title. I've been in the business for roughly 30 years, and during that time I've spent a number of years doing both commercial and residential transactions. Um, I've been a member of NICAR for a number of years now, and over the years, some of you may know me as a guest speaker at a number of other uh, Realtor events, either with NASBAR or WCR or NICAR, and uh, just glad to, to see some familiar faces and some new faces, too. Okay, Time's good. up, right? Yeah, so. <laughs> um, Marty, the last question. I don't know if you probably don't remember. <laughs> the scenario, residential broker's client asks, I want to buy, lease, sell commercial property. The broker asks themselves, what do I do now? Where do I start? What do I need to do? Who do I turn to? Well, I actually turn to people like myself, Bill Caton, Teresa, who understand commercial, bring them in as your mentor, and have, you, have them walk you through the whole process. And it's a very easy process. People tell you that commercial is difficult. When I started writing these courses seven years ago, I kept on saying to myself, this industry has not changed one iota in seven, you know, in 55 years. So it's key to find, and most companies do have managing brokers understand commercial. Baron Warner has Ian Robinson, great guy to work with. Ian would call me, if he has a problem, he would call me and say, hey, what the hell do I do with this? And we, we share each other's ideas back and forth. Rebecca is a great source of resources, of places we can go to. So it's hire yourself, bring in a mentor, and learn the business, and come to our classes. I think Teresa, are you going to start a couple classes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right after this, right after <laughs> the wine hour. <laughs> 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 Not perfect. So I mean, that's where it comes down to. 
And there is a thing called Title Article 11, where, you know, technically you can really get in trouble if you misquote, mislead someone. The insurance companies will pull that out in a minute and your you know, insurance is not covered. You've violated the law, which is not just the Illinois law, it's NARS law. It's a code of ethics. Right? It's a code of ethics. And I happen to be married to a very tough attorney <laughs> who she really practices the whole thing about ethics. Anybody else want to make a comment on this? I would just say that if you're in this position of your scenario, start looking at where you're spending your time. I mean, you can go on the internet and find a lot of good information, uh, but also networking. Networking at events like this with NICAR, A, or any of the other commercial areas that you go to, and find that person that you feel comfortable with. If you don't know somebody that you feel comfortable with right now, and just have that conversation, all right? You'd be surprised how willing okay, people are to share their backgrounds and their experience with you. Okay? So don't be shy. Get out there and, you know, avail yourself of the people in the networking events and advantages that are out there. Going off the first question, you talked about mentorship, that type of thing. How about partnering versus referring? I mean, Teresa, do you want to make a comment on that? Sure. Um, so if you are very early stages of, I don't really know what I should do, you know, obviously there's the networking piece and I would like to give a plug there and there's the education piece, uh, but just finding a commercial broker that you feel comfortable with and say, you know what, I've got a lead. You know, someone has contacted me recently. I have several different businesses, but they've contacted me. They said, you know what, I don't really feel comfortable. Either they want to come along and learn about the process or they're just going to refer it saying, you know what, it's not the piece of business that I'm gonna do. Like I'm representing a dog business, a doggy daycare business. He's like, you know what, I, I only do multifamily. I don't really know anything else. I don't understand the whole zoning, etc." cetera. Uh, another one, it's um, selling a mechanic shop. Again, this is someone who wants to partner. He's like, I really would like to learn. So he will be giving me a referral fee, but in, in turn, he's also learning about the process of what is involved from the listing side, the, you know, who, who are my available buyers, et cetera. Uh, the plug that I had wanted to talk about was Bill and I are part of a commercial global business network that's among NICAR. So you can go to any one of NICAR events and find commercial brokers there that are willing to have a conversation and you know, potentially be a mentor. You know, it's always kind of strange, like, can you be my mentor? Like, it seems like a strange question. But you know, you'll find who the right people are to reach out. and. Everyone in this room, everyone in the world is welcome to come to our global business networking meetings. Uh, we, there's also broker breakfast, etc. But there we give an opportunity to learn about commercial real estate, not just at the local scale, but at the global scale. So you could be a fly on the wall for all these events for free and learn a lot about commercial practices here and abroad if you so choose. Okay. Well, I did want to jump in a little bit about the partnering versus referral. The reality is, is that you get to pay. You get to choose and you get to, once you have built some relationships within commercial real estate, depending what sort of deal comes your way, there may be some that you do want to learn on, a direction that you may want to go, and there may be areas that you really don't want to. And it's all a negotiable. It's all part of conversations and relationships and having some people to go to. And I would say every one of us on this panel, if we couldn't help you, we would find the person to help you. Like that is exactly what we do in our businesses on a daily basis. Some of the ways that residential is known for being a little bit close to the best and being um, maybe a little bit more competitive, in my experience at least, and I've been through this since 2003, so that makes it almost 20 years, it's far more conciliatory, it's far more collaborative and commercial, such that we want to introduce you to the right person to help you, like, because a rising tide lifts all boats. So there's not competition for deals in the same way that you might have experienced in other sectors. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to the mentorship program. So, um, instead of referring, like I said, I got involved with the mentorship program in my office. And before my office offered that, I had people in my network approach me asking me to assist with business sales. And I would honestly say, I don't think I'm the, you know, the most qualified candidate and I would be learning at your expense and I you know, just pass those opportunities up. Now, when a commercial opportunity comes my way, even if I'm not 
well, I work in that specific industry, I know I've got Marty in my corner and I welcome it and I tan that initial call and then immediately call Marty and be like, okay, what are the, you know, what are the next steps and potential pitfalls? So it's been um, a tremendous opportunity to get my feet wet but also do what's right for my clients. And, uh, and in the beginning, in the early stages when we were in front of clients, you know, I would speak up when I knew what was appropriate and when I didn't, I would just stay quiet and let Marty take the lead and then obviously learn and continue to get more experience that way. Yeah, I would just say in general, um, if you're weighing the options between referral uh, or partnering, you know, as everybody's on this panel, you're going to want to introduce yourself and get to know uh, experienced commercial people, um, whether it's a mentorship program or what have you. Um, I think from a business perspective, you have to really ask yourself, you know, are you just involved in perhaps one or two commercial deals or do you have a chance to do many more? If you have a chance to do one or two, then maybe referral might be the route to go, but if you have a chance to do several and add that to your pipeline, then um, partnership might be something you want to look at more closely and, and in any event, you'd want to talk to somebody on the commercial and it's experienced and, and set up some sort of mentoring program with that. Yes, and there's sometimes that you just want to refer it out. Um, for example, I love doing land, industrial, game, investment sales, or anything like that. But somebody puts a leasing thing in front of me, I refer it immediately. I just don't have an interest in doing it. Uh, and fortunately, I have good people in my office that I can refer it out to. And success is not necessarily in the commercial business being the go-to for everything. The most successful people I see in the in the commercial business are focused people. They focus, they specialize, all right? And they specialize in that one area or two areas, and they become an expert at it. And when you become an expert at it, you don't care what's going on in the marketplace, all right? Because the market does what it's gonna do, and you can't control that. All you can do is be an expert, because you will be looked to as for advice or uh, a, a uh, an advisor in all those times where the market's going up or going down and you have the opportunity to make money. So it's not always the most prudent person that, you know, takes on everything themselves, all right? Know what your interest is, know what your capabilities are, what your passions are, follow those and focus and become an expert in that one. And you might have a side one or two, but basically you have a main thing that you're focusing on. Just a point about referring to, I, I think with residential brokers who are not really, don't really know about commercial real estate, when you're referring, you're going to get a 20, 25% referral fee. And they're, they're going to be taken care of by an expert, your client. So look at it that way. Look at it, making money on, on the referral. So um, if you're not sure about commercial, if you don't really want to get into it, think about the referral. And, and I would find it, find it professional to refer it to if you really don't want to get into it, and, and you know, that's, that's, that's most of the advice I have. Yeah, and I'd like to ask Matt here in a few minutes, okay, and that is, why be a mentee? All right, he's alluded to it a little bit, okay? But when you look at it, uh, the first thing is you're gonna have a higher probability of success in whatever you do, all right, if you become a mentee. Uh, faster time to a paycheck, and I think that's critical in this business because everybody's pretty well aware of that your business cycle is longer in commercial, okay? Maybe not leasing, okay? That's a little bit faster, all right? Uh, maybe that's why I don't like it, it's too fast. <laughs> uh, it, it's a longer uh, uh, cycle, okay? So it's faster to a paycheck, and it's faster to getting to that higher level of earnings, uh, because as, as brokers, everybody's concerned about percentages, right? But in my world, 100% of nothing is still nothing, all right? So. Um, getting on to education and training. Um, Marty, Bill, you have background in, in education. Marty, you, you're doing it right now. Um, i to ask you, what is your suggestion as far as education and training? If you just get into the courses that we offer through NICAR, NASBAR, uh, the school that I teach at, there are definitely courses out there that are going to come up in September. I have nine courses with the state that I, you know, teach in. So we just jump in, learn the courses. Yeah. Teresa? Uh, I have taken all the CCIM courses. 
I actually have submitted my portfolio and hopefully we'll take the exam in October. And so there are certainly great courses available through the association, but the CCIM uh, provides the analytics, especially if you're going to do any sort of investment sales. But it also, once you have that um, designation, it gives you not just respect in the industry, but potential collaboration with other CCIM uh, designees. Yes, and if you don't have the time or the energy, the money right now to go after your CCIM, because it, it is quite a, a, um, an obligation, both financially and time-wise, uh, CCIM puts out smaller uh, snippets of information that covers every asset class. Uh, they're very affordable. They're, once you get them, you can store them on your computer and review them time after time. Uh, I know that uh, both of my partners are CCIM, uh, and we've downloaded, I think we have a library of like a hundred plus of these that have been you know, uh, broadcasted over the years. So there's hardly a topic out there that you can't get some reasonable ed you know, education for. Uh, Marty and myself and Barbara, are on the education committee for NICAR, which is sponsoring this today. We're looking at a lot of different avenues, okay, to bring education to not only career-minded, you know, people in, in their, well into their career, but people that are looking at, you know, maybe making that transition in the future. Uh, and we're looking at several of those wheels. Instead of trying to reinvent them, we're looking for wheels that already exist. And we've got a couple of good things that uh, hopefully we can announce in the future and bring forward to you. What does CCIM stand for? That's a great so question. Commercial investment method. Say it again. Iowa. Commercial investment method. That's, again, I was, <laughs> investment that's correct. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 um, anything else? Anybody want to make a comment? We had talked about this a little bit before. I mean, timing for residential property let's say it's a sale versus the sale of a commercial property. What is the difference? What needs to be done? I think we talked about the commission agreements, that type of thing. What about LOIs versus presenting a, a contract on the spot? Um, I think a lot of residential agents are used to offering a contract and they're done with it. Tell me about, Rebecca, tell me about how, we, how we're going to do a commercial uh, sales uh, deal. And how does that start and how much time it's going to take? Well, we're going to send out information listing the property and then we may do a call for offers and then we may have, which, in which case that we would be expecting letters of intent to come in. They're non-binding, but they lay out the basic terms of the deal. Subsequent to that, we may actually ask for a best and final, at which point, well, which of course is what you do in residential also, but what you guys are typically presenting in residential are contracts and these are letters of intent. During that process, when a, letter, when a letter of intent is signed, then it starts going into a due diligence process during which the contract is actually negotiated as part of that due diligence process. So does, so does a letter of intent hold any water or is just Only if it's binding. Oh. One, well, it needs to be executed by both parties. Okay, but so, and, and it's legally binding. It's, no, not at all. Not one bit legally binding. Okay. But it is the basis for the contract. So the terms that are presented in that LOI are very much expected to be in the contract. So if a contract was presented, you know, very, very different from that LOI, that would be a little bit of a surprise. Do they ever match the first time? <laughs> Just asking for a friend? <laughs> well, they do the first time. It's the third, fourth, fifth iteration and the retrades where it stops matching. Mm -hmm. So as, as far as deals in the past, um, any, anybody? If, what, how long does a deal take? A typical deal, uh, uh, some deals that have taken forever. I know I've been in deals with taken two years. So I would just say in Chris general, you probably want to adjust your expectations. Um, if you're used to closing deals in 90 days or less on residential, um, more many times you can expect deals to go weeks or months, um, depending on the nature of the commercial deal. I've seen deals that can take six months to close from the letter of intent all the way through closing. And there's been deals that can take a year or more. So um, obviously at the end of the day, you, you're anticipating uh, 
bigger revenue check on a commercial deal, just keep in mind, volume-wise, uh, just because there's so many more moving parts involved, that can take a lot longer to close. What about the cost involved in a deal such as that, a longer deal? Absolutely. So the cost can can be can be different um, depending on dollar amounts, you know, liability amounts, sales prices, and things like that, and sure. and has, depending just on the nature of the transaction, um, an office. Uh, Storefront might be pretty basic, but if you start getting into industrial property, it could be a lot more. So it just depends on the nature of the transaction, the parties involved, and, and just the characteristics in general. Any other comments? Matt, you want to make a comment? <laughs> yeah, sure. I, you know, I think the expectation on residential is to be very responsive when you're working with the other agent, or even your clients. And in commercial, you know, your client might be an employee. They're not the business owner, but they're an employee representing an organization. And if it's Friday afternoon, they wait till Monday at nine to look at that email. So you might go, you know, almost three days without a response. When on the residential side, if things are moving, and three days goes by, you're like, "What's going on?" And the deal's falling apart. But in commercial, it's much more cool. Why well, I asked him, Matt? Matt is doing a very unique development, <clears throat> and I'm walking him through it, and he keeps calling, "Do I need this? Do I need that? Do I need this?" <laughs> and I said, "Yes." And I was yesterday morning. Yeah. I said, okay, man, you know, and I can mention the municipality. I said, how much do you have involved in this with the municipality? He said, you got to go in, pour them out this thing, and some of the numbers he came up with is very close to $100,000 of his money out of his pocket to do this development. So, it, it, um, I've done a lot of developments, and so has Rebecca, how much we, you know, we've taken out of our pocket to do it. But the nature of the project, getting involved, that's where you really need a mentor or someone to guide you down the road on these projects. Some take a year, some take six months, some take a month. It's, you know, it depends on how organized this whole process really is. But it's, it, again, no secrets, none. When he calls up and asks me, I, I give him the direction and give him what's going on. And I think the more experience you have and the more your clients trust you, uh, you also have the capability of charging your clients up front for your time and saying something like, hey, I'll rebate, rebate that once I get this commission, if it's a year and a half project or whatever. So especially if you have a designation like CCIA <coughs> or another uh, resource is CRE, Counselors of Real Estate. And certainly a lot of them, that's what they are doing because they know they have a wealth of knowledge and they don't want to give it away for free. So they're saying, I'm happy to do all this up front and I hope I really do get a big commission, but if it all falls apart after 18 months and I have nothing, so that's one of the ways that you can commission or uh, structure your pay. Yeah, Rebecca and I did a deal two years ago in Michigan City. Two years ago, we represented me, what? Three yes. <laughs> really good. Uh, we literally put a whole development package together. She uh, <laughs> really did most of the work. And we charged a, a consulting fee based on, et cetera. And if the whole thing came through, we reimbursed back the client from our commission. Mm -hmm. So it's a fee for service. Yes. Yeah, so and I, th I think I, we should clarify that Matt's deal is as a principal. Oh yeah, you should have said that. So he's, he's not a broker <laughs> spending a hundred grand, just to be clear. Right. But as a principal, right. he has a long time frame, which means that if he were represented by someone who, as a broker, they would also be on that same timeline. So right. I just wanted to clarify. I should have said that. Matt is the broker developer in this thing. Right now. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Bro you scare he's people away. He's, right. He's a broker. You are the broker, and you are the developer. Correct. But he's declared himself all the way down the line with this whole situation. Yeah, so there's two words that we have used to differentiate that, and that is when you're getting into a deal, is it going to be a paycheck or a project? <laughs> <laughs> all right? And you have to make that deci deciding factor. If it's going to be a project, all right, and you can't control it, because these projects are controlled by municipalities, by lawyers, by the economy, by everything that's going on, uh, we've now come up with a consulting agreement on these projects. Uh, and 
by becoming known in the industry in our area as consultants. We now have consultants with cities. City of Aurora has a consultant with our company. Okay, to what to do with the downtown? They bought up all this, you know, property downtown. They've been sitting on it for years, and now they want to do something with it. Winfield has done that also with our company, and so has Aurora Winfield. Joliet okay, has done some of that. Uh, but you can also do this on an individual basis. Uh, I did that with a developer in Plainfield who had a huge idea and wanted to pick my brain. And, you know, I'm okay with it. Picking my brain will take about 30 seconds, but then after that, I have to think. <laughs> I have to do some, you know, to, I have to do research, okay, to back up what I'm going to tell it. Uh, so research, time, energy, consulting agreement, put it in front of you, all right? Uh, and that way, you don't feel short of doing things that way. So um, we talked a lot about investment sales, buying property, that type of thing. The other part of uh, commercial, uh, there's several parts of commercial real estate. But one I like to uh, dwell on right now is the tenant landlord rep. How does that work? Um, what is, what's involved with being a tenant rep or a landlord rep? Teresa, do you have any comments? Um, so I'm a landlord myself, so I do a lot of my own rep because I have uh, multiple investment properties. But I also do a lot of tenant rep, uh, especially for retail where they're going in, whether it be bear box or restaurants, etc. And that's where it's really important because if I'm coming in as a tenant rep, I have to make an agreement when we're talking about these commissions with my client like, okay, I'm going to do all this work. Are you going to pay me? Is it going to be the landlord? Um, and then also having patience on both sides because, you know, like one of the recent deals, it was a retail restaurant deal, it took over eight months of negotiating because I was representing a newer business owner and they really want a national, right? So we had to do lots of pro forma and proving ourselves, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm on both sides, but typically more of my landlord rep is me as my for investment properties um typically well, not typically when you come to go to landlord rep or tenant rep a lot of times either the, the landlord will offer or the tenant will ask for tenant improvements what does what does that mean Money. <laughs> 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 but, i mean if, if, if let's say yeah, I mean, it, it's it's up to the landlord or the tenant who, who puts up the money to do the improvements. Mm -hmm. So you, you negotiate the deal between the two. So. You'll you'll see that quite a bit with uh, shopping centers over the years. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, uh, as you mentioned, that kind of just entails <coughs> negotiating between the two parties as to how much the landlord may want to um, allocate towards that. Um, so. It, Really, just depends on the, the business cycle where we are as to whether the tenant has more or less uh, uh, leverage in that regard. Yeah, business cycles huge in, in this tenant uh, TI game going back and forth because sometimes the that's the only way you can fill your center. Okay, we've seen those those times, okay, post COVID and and some of the recessionary times where you know you were offering high TI to somebody so that you could get them in your center and fill them up. Uh, during the times whenever the market's really hot, okay, then it shifts, okay. The TI dollars go to uh, the tenant, okay, and the tenant is paying it to get in there and to, to do those kind of things. So it's, it's a negotiating tool back and forth between the two. Uh, being a tenant rep, okay, of somebody in, let's say, a national tenant or, you know, there's somebody that wants to do 15 offices, okay, in an area or whatever that is. Having an agreement in writing is critical, okay? You have to have that agreement in writing. Spelling out, you know, what your obligations are, what you're going to get paid. Uh, we have several brokers um, in our company that are doing tenant rep, okay? Again, that's not my area. Uh, one's been doing it for my quite a few years for 7-Eleven in 38 states. That's pretty much his entire business, is doing the tenant rep. He's bringing in his daughter, okay, to help him and assist with that. Uh, another one's in five different states with gas stations, C-stores, uh, uh, 
Taco Bells. Okay, so all of those, you know, and he has written agreements as to how he gets paid and when he gets paid to those things. One of my courses, the 101, is commercial leasing. We cover all the, what Bill just said, how you get in and out, tenant improvements, landlord improvements, leases, etc. It's a three-hour course, and it's, I designed it for residential agents to understand the basics uh, of the whole thing. What, what does it mean by a tenant rep? And you know, who pays for it? What's a leasing commission, etc. cetera? So yeah. that, Sign me up. What? I don't know if this is on the list of questions, but <laughs> he um, mentioned about working in multiple states. So could we, because a lot of people are curious about that, like, well, how if I'm only <laughs> licensed in this state, how am I doing business in other states? That's a Bill? Very, very good point. Okay, so that's a question that um, takes a lot of research. Uh, mm -hmm. We paid a, an attorney, uh, I'll share his name, Jim Hockman. He's probably the expert in this. Uh, uh, it's called reciprocity, licensing law reciprocity among states. Uh, there are different types of states, okay? Uh, there's a, a, a turf states where it says you can't even step in that state and represent your client, can't be with your client, can't talk to your client, can't do anything in that state except transfer or refer the business out to somebody else, okay? Uh, then the opposite end of that are green states, which are have a lot of recipro reciprocity with us, and you can go in there. Every one of them has a set of paperwork that you have to get signed, filled out by buyers, sellers, brokers in every state. So it is um, very complicated. However, if you break it down in bite-sized pieces and take one state at a time, like my CEO, uh, Amy Hall is done for us. We have all the forms set up. She's an expert on which ones to use at which time. Uh, we're keeping ourselves out of trouble. There is a ton of brokers that are in violation, and if you're you're okay as long as everybody's okay, but you have one thing go wrong, all right, and then you're going to lose your license. Bottom line, that's the, there's no in, in or out of that. Texas, you want to, or Texas, you want to stay out of that state because they're going to come after your license. They, they, they pride themselves uh, in, in going after real estate licensees that come into their state and try to do business. What, what about using a broker in that state as far as paying them 5-10% to represent your client? We do. We have, we have brokers that we have preferred brokers in every state that we work with, and some states more than one. Uh, but they, you have to have the uh, correct paperwork filled out for every case, all right? So you just can't go to a broker and say, let's work together, all right? Uh, every single individual case that you bring to them has to be documented with the correct paperwork signed by everybody. I've often heard said that your network is your net worth. And that's one of the reasons why networking is so important in commercial real estate, because it really does enable the, you to do greater transactions, because you don't want to pick up the phone and just call someone. If I have, I happen to know that Peter's licensed in California. If I know someone who's going to California and needs a great broker, I'm gonna call Peter, 100%, because he, I know he's licensed in California. He's actually probably the only person I know who's licensed in California, so he's guaranteed to get that business. But through organizations like ICSC or other more national, broader organizations, I have gotten to know people from all over the country. And I have clients for my marketing business in Florida and in Nashville and in Massachusetts and in all sorts of other states. So innately, I'm going to contact those people that I have already built a relationship with in order to make those referrals. Rather, And sometimes, like if you're part of a broader organization, of course, KW has many, many offices all over, and so you have a built-in referral network. Uh, any other questions in the, in the audience that you have? Mm -hmm. uh, hi, I'm Lali Jatta, and I'm in second chapter of my life, originally from Bombay. Settled here in Chicago in 97, accidentally. So, <laughs> accidentally, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, because I used to send a CNC software on a pair of in floppy to a company in Adani, and he encouraged me to come to U.S. to understand the entrepreneurial culture. And my wife got her H1 done by Discover. That's how I landed here. <laughs> I wanted to be in California. 
<laughs> and if it finds a fast forward, <laughs> what do you us now? Exactly. <laughs> Thank you for Nika because I'm a technologist doing technology bread and butter since 1986, hardware, software. Accidentally coming to Chicago, I started at a hedge fund, 20 years in Wall Street capital markets. Two years back, I decided to do my real estate license, took a Nika membership, convinced my managing broker at work club. I want to come through NICA because I wanted to get into industry. So my question is, I'm an innovator, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an investor, and I believe in doing by learn, uh, learning by doing. So my question is, we were founder, big unicorn, failed, but two weeks back, he got another backing by one of the world's top VC to disrupt the residential space. You guys are from commercial space. Um, I used to be a WeWork member since I left my mom's time job in 2017. I love it as a client, user. What are your uh, observations? Because it goes both ways, residential and commercial. But now he's focused on disrupting the residential real estate. What do you think about the office space on commercial side? And what do you think what's going to happen on residential side? Because we are in very fast changing world. So I see there is some good insights we might get from all of you. Yes, so we're, we have a, an office expert in the room uh, it, you know, that's working in that area. So Andy, how would you? Yeah, Andy, please. <laughs> <laughs> I do work with a company called Upflex in addition to Kate and Commercial. And Upflex, we work as one of the major investors in the company. And we work directly with WeWork. So we have a little bit of insight on where their thinking comes from. And additionally, some ex WeWork folks, even like employee number 20, has joined our team recently. But the change in office is becoming more on demand, meaning more and more people are looking to use offices less often and not full time. So it's more of like an Airbnb type of model, oftentimes, for distributed workforce. And that's what Upflex is focusing on. And from what I've heard from Adam Newman, what he's done, I guess he $350 million. Is that what oh, yeah. he just raised last year? He's ready yeah. for that. But I think. I mean, it's almost like another play that they're doing on the co-living market that he was trying to do with WeWork initially. It was called We Live, which was basically like a compartmental rent by the bedroom furnished model for apartment rentals in urban areas. Um, there are other players who did much better than, than We Live in that space, but I think he's kind of attacking that again and trying to basically create this ecosystem where people can use space more on demand for when they need it versus like this longer term type of space usage. So that's my insight. But there's also a cultural component to it, right? Like, uh, Just because I don't think people have totally adopted this idea of the, the uh, cooperative living, right? Like that this is like with industrious and whatever. Yeah. So I think it's been successful in an onset, but it's a whole mindset change for a lot yeah. of people. And it's not easy to just scale because of the yeah, it, mindset. It's like everything else, it's going through an evolution, all right? They've been first, you know, Andy and I, and I, I went to Mippen and I brought back a German company in co-living, all right? Uh, and it, that was the beginning of co-living. It started back in 2016, which is really, really recent, okay? Since I'm really, really ancient. So it's really <laughs> since, uh, but you know, that, Co-living has now evolved into called social living, all right? So it's, it's bringing people together in a living situation, uh, especially in certain age groups. Uh, and it's not just for the, we, we were working with a 25 to 35 year old uh, group, right? which is the number one cause of death in that group is suicide because of loneliness. Right? They're real good with their thumbs, but they're not very good at talking to people eye to eye. Uh, but that's also expanded in now to uh, social living for you know people that are in my generation, right? Uh, that experience the same kind of you know mental anguish, and they have the young families, you know. So, so it's it's kind of a, a social experiment which China has been doing for years, right? In, in the way they live in Malta. But I am concerned about corporate America coming into residential homes. Uh, and buying up, again, okay, huge tracts of land. Because I think that takes it out of the grasp of a lot of other people, especially in the you know, uh, low-income housing sector, right, 
no longer can they compete with you know the corporate buyers. So uh, I think it's a, a concern uh, in in the whole revelation, and someplace along the line maybe the government's going to have to get involved all right, with that all right, in order to to solve that. Because one of the things we do have in this country is a shortage of housing stock, okay, at all levels, okay, for affordable people, uh, affordable living. And I'm not talking, you know, the city of Denver, Andy and I did a lot of work in the city of Denver. Te school teachers can't live in Denver. They can't. They yeah. cannot afford, okay, the, 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 the rents. Go ahead, Andy. We witnessed it within a year, and this was about three and a half years ago, that rents, when we started working in Denver, were about a dollar per square foot less than Chicago for multifamily. Within a year, they had surpassed, and now they're probably a dollar more. And they built about 30,000 apartment building uh, units within that time frame, within a couple of years, and they still couldn't keep up with that demand because of this influx of people from the coast, from basically from California, from Seattle, etc., moving to a town like Denver. Yeah. And yeah, and it priced out literally all the kind of um, the people who keep everything running, the teachers, uh, you know, municipality workers, et cetera, they couldn't afford to live in their own town anymore. So it created some very odd dynamics. It's always on the top 10 list from commercial real estate or counselors of real estate where they say, what are the top 10 issues affecting real estate? And affordable housing is a repeat offender over and over again. I think the number one thing that's affecting our industry is this gentleman here, technology. How is technology going to affect our aspects of real estate. Because in real estate, one of the classes like these, there are eight different buckets of real estate that you have to focus on. I teach the eight buckets, and it's technology, how it's affecting our world, etc. Well, it's a little after five right now. Yeah, yeah. you know, and, and I, for just a second, I want to take a moment to thank this group here on behalf of our president, Steve Hudson, NASDAQ's board of directors. You know, it's been my experience, I've only been doing this for a couple of years. My experience with panels is that if you've got a great panel, you can pretty much throw whatever subject you want to throw in front of them and they make it interesting and they're thoughtful and you learn so much. So on behalf of NASBAR and this great strategic alliance that you're talking about that's just been so beneficial, I think, to both organizations, Thank you very much for doing this, and let's celebrate a little bit. Yeah. 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 I'm going to ask you one more thing, please, as you leave. Many of you signed in as you were coming in. If you did not sign in as you were coming in, sign out as you're leave, as you're going. Be, um, Okay, well, hold on. So, Mr. Hudson has a question too, but if you'll sign out when you leave, but don't leave yet because he's got a question. Here. A question from the panel. So, if you were going to bring on a uh, real estate broker to one of your firms, what would be the perfect characteristics or makeup of that person? Uh -huh. A commercial person? Yeah. That they're yeah. ethical? Because <laughs> they yeah. can run amok? <laughs> I always say you have to. Fail your first lobotomy, then you come out in the commercial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, it's what do you want them to know? What do you want skills you want them to have? What, do you, what connections do they need to have? What, what kind of things you, if you come in and work with you, what would you want them to be? I want them to be independent, organized, self confident. Okay, uh, They don't need to know anything. We'll teach them what they need to know. In fact, I prefer it because then I don't have bad habits. Okay, <laughs> Don't get started right. The, the first time, curiosity, and most of all, be coachable, right? Being able to be coached. Right, right. Eager to learn. Right. Curiosity was my number one. Yeah. I, I, curiosity. I think, I think the most important thing is, after teaching people, Bill's 100% correct. But behind your back of your mind, you have to have the financial stabilities to get through a whole year, because it could take that long. Mm -hmm. You could have all those great qualities, if you don't have the financial stability, you're not going to make it. And if you do what Matt's doing and become a mentee, okay, you can cut that down a lot less. Right. Right. In terms of being. Yeah, I was just going to say, I've seen the most successful commercial people, whether it's brokers or anybody in the industry, they typically have a good work ethic, and they have the courage to take on a commercial deal. 
because as Marty mentioned earlier and, and didn't see anybody really notice what he said, I have found sometimes some of the easiest deals can be commercial deals. That's a little dirty secret that you don't talk about. <laughs> no, no drama. That's true. No drama. Yeah. Now, it's yeah. not always the case. I mean, there's some that can be very complex and challenging, but there's a lot that are not, and they're pretty straightforward. But I think if you have a good work ethic and you're not afraid to, you don't look at the dollar signs and get nervous and, and just have that kind of courage to take the next step, I think those types of people have done well in the business. And get a good sense of humor. I think you guys, I have a crazy, she watches my sense of humor all the time. But you just, you have to. But you have to understand, people get up in the morning, they got to pay the rent. So my job is to make sure that Scott and Matt can pay the rent through mentorship. And I keep them on a track. If you're, I've had some mentors, and they want to go off this way. No, no, you're coming back this way. You're not going to go down that road. It's never going to go anywhere. But you know, we're here to help you guys. And you know, Jeff, you know, right, we're here. This panel is here to help. And Bill Caton is, is available any time. Bill and I go back, what, 25 years now? <laughs> it's not In the business? Yeah. Double. Yeah, it's <laughs> the the rocks were on. still warm. <laughs> when the Earth's crust is cooling. <laughs> and Marty, what's what's your ultimate goal for Matthew and I forgot Scott? Scott. Yeah, Scott. What's your goal for them? Honestly, I want them to say I was a teacher. I was taught by Marty Norkin. Like people said, I was a student of, of you know Frank Lord Wright. I want people to understand where I've been. I've been very blessed with the career that I've had in the last 55 years. I had one brother big in politics, another brother big in the Catholic Church in politics, and believe me, it's been an exciting life. Yeah. And, and pass it on, Matt, yeah. Scott, okay? So when your goal is not to be a mentee and uh, forever, it's no. just to get out of that as quick as possible, <laughs> but then give it back to someone else new, become a mentor. Right, and, and so we can grow our organization. Brain trust. Yes, brain well, trust. Well, you think about it this way. The true definition of love is the unselfish desire to help the other person out. You have to have an unselfish desire to give back. what it takes. Let's have some wine. Yeah. <laughs>